<laughs> hey, we're going to start our service this morning with our focus song, which is the bond of love. Give us the happy ending of Frozen. We are here this morning, Lord, because we woke up, we praised you, we were called to this sanctuary. You brought us out onto these roads where the trees are covered with sticky snow, where the grass is adorned with the white stuff. Lord, you have brought us here safely. We trust in you, Lord that no matter what the weather, no matter what the conditions, that we can walk with you and that you will walk hand in hand with us through this service, through this day, through our lives, and you will lead us, Lord, beside the quiet streams, that you will indeed make for us a feast that we can fill ourselves with. Lord, we are here this morning to be filled by you. We call upon you, Lord, as we open our hearts, as we open all of who we are, that you just flood us with your spirit, the way you have clothed the trees in your majesty. Clothe our hearts with your love this morning. We pray in your precious name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to Willow Creek United Methodist Church on Veterans Day. Uh, welcome home, or welcome you guys at home on Facebook, and would you, would you bow with me? Uh, gracious God, from whom all blessings flow, thank you for bringing us out this morning. Thank you for the snow-covered roads. Thank you for all that you have given us and all that you do, Lord. We know it all comes through you, and we love you and praise you, and in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
Those of you in the pews, don't you just envy those that are at home in the kitchen drinking their coffee, looking out their back windows at the snow-covered trees and their lawns and possibly a deer here or there just kind of looking for something. Don't you just envy them sometimes? But there's no reason to envy them because you are here. We have windows here to look out and we have the love of God in our hearts. This first song that we are going to sing has this line, ponder anew what the Almighty can do. And that reminded me of Isaiah chapter 43 verse 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. No matter what we may go through in life, we have a God that is far bigger than everything else. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning and let us praise to the Lord, the Almighty. saying praise to the Lord who prospers my works we get into the habit of thinking that we're the ones that are making things happen when in reality we are merely cooperating with the work that our Lord is doing let us sing let us sing about all grace is what enables us
words we will make is only by His grace. Every mountain we will climb, every ray of hope we shine, every blessing left behind is only by His grace. Grace alone, which God supplies, strength unknown, He will provide. Christ in us, our cornerstone, we will go forth in grace alone. Every soul we long to reach, every heart we hope to teach, everywhere we share His peace is only by His grace. Every loving word we say, every tear we by His grace. Grace alone, which God supplies, strength unknown, He will provide. Christ in us, our cornerstone, we will go forth in grace alone. If you read 1 Corinthians, if you read the New Testament letters of Paul, you know that at a couple of churches anyway, they were arguing over which of the spiritual gifts were the more prominent ones, were the, were the more higher classed ones. They were arguing over those things. And Paul was saying, you do have spiritual gifts. Everybody has one or more than one. But if you don't have love, then they're just like, stuff in the world. It is Christian love that binds us together. It is Christian love that makes those spiritual gifts take the church forward. It is spiritual love that lets us look forward to Christmas time where people sometimes spend hours in traffic trying to get home. Let us sing. We are one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond of love. We are joined our spirit with the spirit of God. We are one in the bond of love. We have joined our spirit with the spirit of God. We are one in the Go ahead and say hello to your neighbors in the sanctuary and people of Facebook and YouTube. Good morning. And then you may be seated. We're going to recognize and honor veterans. And by golly, nobody does that better than Ruth. Good morning. Happy Veterans Day. It is a kind of a tradition here at Willow Creek to honor our veterans, and we do that every year in a slightly different way. Um, this year I'm going to do a reading, and then I'm going to ask our veterans to come up. Instead of by branch, I'm going to ask you to come up oldest veteran to youngest veteran who's present here today. And I asked Michael and Izzy to come help me so we can kind of move things along. <laughs> Now, no person was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been the reward for what he gave. President Calvin Coolidge. 
You may not know me the first time we meet. I'm just another you see on the street. But I am the reason you walk and breathe free. I am the reason for your liberty. I am a veteran. I work in the local factory all day. I own the restaurant just down the way. I sell you insurance. I start your IV. I've got the best looking grandkids you'll ever see. I'm your grocer, your banker, your child's school teacher. I'm your plumber, your barber, your family preacher. But there's parts of me you don't know very well. Just listen a moment. I have a story to tell. I am a veteran. I joined the service while still in my teens. I traded prom dresses and fast cars for camouflage greens. I'm the first in my family to do something like this. I followed my father like he followed his. Defying my fears and hiding my doubt, I married my sweetheart before I shipped out. I missed Christmas, then Easter, the birth of my son, but I knew I was doing what had to be done. I've served on the battlefront, I served on the base. I bound up the wounded and begged for God's grace. I gave orders to fire. I followed commands. I marched into conflict in far distant lands. In the jungles, the deserts, on mountains and shores, in bunkers and tents, on dark earthen floors. While I fought on the ground, in the air, on the sea, my family and friends were home praying for me. For the land of the free and the home of the brave, I faced my demons in foxholes and caves. Then one dreaded day without drummer or fife, a buddy lost an arm, another lost his life. I came home and moved on, but forever was changed. The perils of war in my memory remained. I don't really say much. I don't feel like I can. But I left home a child and came home a man. There are thousands like me, thousands more who are gone, but their legacy lives as time marches on. White crosses in rows and names carved in queue remind us of what these brave souls had to do. I'm part of a fellowship, a strong, mighty band of each man and each woman who has served this great land. And when old glory waves, I stand proud, I stand tall. I helped keep her flying over you, over all. I am a veteran. I am not, but I hope that that resonates with each one of you out there who is. So in your bags this morning, you don't each have a copy of this little ditty I wrote. Um, not nearly as profound or touching as that, but it also won't bring you to tears, which that one does me when I read it. To our veterans, we want to thank you for stepping up at crunch time, there's crunch bars in your bag, and putting yourselves betwixt us and harm, there's Twix bars in your bag, you catching a the theme. Some of you flew through the Milky Way among the starbursts, while others rollowed, play on words, tanks over mounds, and still others were lifesavers on the seas. To be sure, none of you are zeros or duds, milk duds, and it's our joy, almond and otherwise, to honor you. So take five today. Share some Whoppers and Snickers and tears with your buddies, just like the Three Musketeers. Your sacrifice is the reason we can worship today. And we love you to pieces. Hugs and kisses, a grateful nation. Our oldest veteran. Who is our oldest veteran this morning? Mr. Wayne Lavengood. Are you going to try and come up? Okay. Okay. Is he older than you?
<laughs> Get me in trouble. Get me in trouble. So Michael and Isabella are helping me this morning, and you will each get a bag with the snacks or treats that I mentioned, and you will each get a card with a small gift card that is a token of our appreciation as a congregation. Is this one on? We good? Mr. Wayne, can yes. you tell us what branch of the service you were in? United States Air Force. And how many years? How many years? Four years active, one year active reserve. Thank you for your service. So who's next in age line? Yeah, you can clap between each one. That's fine. <laughs> who's next in age line? Is that you, Mr. Gene? George is older than Gene? All right, George. He's walking kind of slow. You can beat him, George. <laughs> Mr. George, can you tell us branch of the service and how many years? Uh, U.S. Army, uh, two years and four years inactive. Thank you for your service. I'll give you a handshake. <laughs> hey, Michael, can you take Mr. Jeans to his wife in the front row, you two? Um, so that way he doesn't have to try and get back down there with a the walker. Can you give us your branch of the service and how many years? Army, three years in, one year inactive. Thank you for your service. Who's next? Age-wise, who's next? Hmm. <laughs> Appears to be you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jim, branch of the service and years in. Uh, Army, and it was three years active and three years unactive. Awesome. Thank you for your service. <laughs> who's next? I believe, Mr. Tommy Saylor, you are next. Look at that picture. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for Thank your you. service. Branch of the service and years in. United States Navy, five years, three years ready reserve. I also know that we have two other veterans in this congregation. I'm not sure where. I think Vicki's already back in children's message. Um, but we have Corbin Vance, who was United States Marine Corps. And we have my oldest son, Alexander, who was um, United States Army with the Army National Guard. Um, I know Alex was in Afghanistan. I believe Corbin was as well. Um, so... Um, thank you to all of our veterans. We are a grateful nation, and we are here today because of you. Well, thank you. If you need help getting back down, Michael and Izzy can give you a hand. Help Mr. Gene down. They all look so young in those pictures, don't they? And I know if any of them, oh my goodness, it's like, I just also want to say, you know, a heartfelt uh, thank you uh, for you folks that have served. I, I, I posted on Facebook a little thank you uh, Thursday, but it is very, very meaningful because I'm always reminded that you know, I get to say, 
tomorrow I think I'll go see a movie. Or I get to say, well, I'm going to plan out something for next week or when my vacation is going to be for next year or whatever. And I get to open up my calendar and I get to just start planning things, knowing that for most, most of it, I have the ability to do that, to make my own plans. And uh, my life is generally safe, you know, from things. But then I think of people that have signed their lives over to the military. And it's like, you guys, you women, you guys, you know, you just, you uh, surrender yourselves to decisions that other people make. You don't get to be with your families. You don't get to make plans like I get to make. And, and uh, I really, really appreciate that. Um, and I, I know, and Ruth said it well, and she read it well, um, you know, there, there's just a lot of liberty and stuff like that that we have. But I hope that you receive this from my personal heart, that I recognize that the reason that I was able to do so many things that I've done in life is because you chose to give up doing so many things in life so that I could. That's a big thing, okay? And I recognize it, all right? Anyway, that's a celebration. That, that's a big celebration. Um, and I think that very often, like we go through life and we don't always stop and think that there's somebody in uniform, whether it be military, police, firemen, that's kind of like risking their life and going out of their way for me. You know, I think that we go through our days and weeks and everything, and we have all of these blessings in our life, and it's like, huh, God just is throwing blessings at me, and I'm taking them for granted? Ugh, ouch. What do we want to make sure we praise God about other than our veterans? Vicki. Some good natured person has filled the, the the cart with food for for the homeless, for the needy, and so that's wonderful. Uh, Zach, I'm going to come to you pretty soon here, but because I overheard something, I'm the best eavesdropper ever you will meet. Diane. Well, she's not here, but we love her, and today is officially Haley's birthday. Yeah. yeah. And I told her she should have been here. But anyway, so she's celebrating, so um, I just ask God to keep her safe today because she's not home, and let her have an amazing birthday because she's awesome. So, thank you. Happy, happy birthday, Haley. I have a thank you. Actually, you have a thank you. This is from Elsie Rogers School. Uh, if you didn't know, we recently dropped off the uh, neighborhood school fund checks to Elsie Rogers and to Bigger Elementary. Uh, they were $825 each uh, that we gave to the schools uh, from our, our big drive that we've had over the last several months. And this is from the principal at Elsie Rogers. She writes, Dear Ms. Miller and the Willow Creek community, Thank you so much for the amazing donation you gave Elsie Rogers. It was a beautiful surprise. We appreciate the support from our community members. We think we will use the money toward our school-wide reading initiative. Sincerely, the Elsie Rogers Roadrunners. So if you're not familiar, Elsie Rogers, if you go down a couple of stoplights to Current Road and go north, it's right there uh, up on Current Road before you get to McKinley. We have been helping them out now for the past... Uh, three, three, four years with different things. And sometimes it went to school lunch. Sometimes it went to help book fees. And this year, we just gave them the money and said, use it as you think best. And so that's what they chose, and I think that was really touching. So thank all of you for your support. And uh, it was a blessing to me to be able to deliver the checks. So thank you. One of the spiritual gifts that Paul mentions is hospitality. 
And I know that what I say next fits in that, that hospitality in one way or another, but uh, we want to just make sure that we, we recognize and celebrate the fact that somebody out of a sense of hospitality plowed the snow away in our parking lot this morning. And we also want to acknowledge that somebody out of a sense of hospitality made sure that the leaves were, were off the, the grass uh, before um, the snow fell and everything. And I know that that takes time, you know, it takes time to do that. And so I just want to say thank you to those people that made that happen. Why don't we stand this morning and let us give thanks to God because we know that God showers us with so very many blessings. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all body, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. I invite you to be seated because God's ears and God's heart has now accepted our praise but all the more his heart and his ears have been opened because he knows what we do next he's on the edge of his seat waiting to hear what we're going to say next Zach give us an update on your mom don't think I gave an update before. Uh, she went to the hospital a couple weeks ago because she was having breathing issues, and uh, she has COPD. So, but this was getting really bad. So um, she's she's in the hospital for a while, but they moved her to rehab um, over in Holy Cross Village, off of 23 over here. Um, I went to visit her a couple days ago, and she, I. She, I've never seen her like as well in person. Like, yeah, it's a concern that she's there, but it's also a praise that she's there because the treatment she's getting, she's loving it, and she had like color in her face. She was very talkative, very happy to see me, and I quite frankly haven't seen that much life in her in a long time, and it made me happy for the direction that she might be going in and for the care that she's getting as a son that made my heart warm, so. Zach has a thank you to God for bringing his mom to a point of some sort of joy in her life, and yet also simultaneously it is a prayer because, you know, she's, she's not like up and running around healthy, you know, she has stuff to deal with. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so this one's actually a concern. Um, so my parents, uh, they taken in all, uh, several stray cats over the years. I think at one point we got up to 10. Um, but lately there's been kind of a little disease going around uh, that's, I think, taken the lives of at least three of the cats that I know about. Um, this has been within the last couple of weeks. So I just pray that none of the cats, especially the ones that I grew up with, just keep dying off that they that they're able to stay healthy. Zach, in his good nature, is asking for prayers for cats, and I, I'm, I'm heartfelt about that myself because I really like cats, and God likes animals too. I mean, the remember the Sabbath thing isn't just for us to rest, it's for all the animals to rest. And Noah also decided to bring all those animals on board the cruise ship there at the direction of God. And uh, so God does care about animals, about pets and everything. And so we're praying. We're praying for the cats as well. Diane. Yes, sir. I have a friend uh, that I reached out to, and uh, I used to work with her. She fell off a six-foot ladder at home on cement, and she fractured T7 through T11 vertebrae and crushed T11 vertebrae. She had five hours of surgery, and um, she's just asking for prayers because she is home. 
recovery, but it's going to be a long recovery. So she just asked for prayers. For me? Laura. We are praying for Laura, who was working on a ladder and fell off of that and had surgery on various uh, back parts there. And so we're, uh, we're praying for her. We're praying for others that have had similar issues like that and, and accidents like that. Let us humble ourselves. Let us go to prayer. Knowing full well, and, and I want to take the moment so that we really receive this, because it's not really anything from me, it's, it's, it's from God, that God does care about your lives. He cares about the lives of the people that you know and love, and he cares about the lives of people that you don't know and you'll never know. We show that we are Christ-like when we can extend our prayer life out beyond those that we know personally and that we can ask for God to heal and to protect those that we don't know. And so bearing that in mind and knowing that God is big enough to attend to all of these things and knowing that God cares and loves us enough to attend to these things, let us trust as we go into prayer. Our Lord humbling ourselves we do come to you and we do know Lord because we are bewildered that you can know everything in our mind and in our heart and yet you want us to speak these prayers you want us to say aloud in the presence of each other what our concerns are and who we are concerned about and we do so this morning Lord, indeed, we pray for Laura. We pray for everyone else like Laura that has had accidents, that has been damaged. Heal these people. Bring them back to a point in their lives where they can be about doing the things that you have called them to do, that they can live out the spiritual gifts that you have dropped into their lives. Lord, heal these people so that they can be with their families and they can be at work and they can be doing the things that interests them and calms them and excites them. Lord, we pray. We pray for Zach's mom, and we thank you that she is in good spirits. But, Lord, we pray that you bring a sense of peace to Zach. You bring a sense of peace to her. You bring a sense of peace to all that are experiencing difficult times, and they have good days, and they have bad days, and they have I don't know what kind of days. They don't even know how to assess their days because they are so bewildered. We are not 20 years old anymore, Lord. Very few of us in this building are, are 20 or younger. Most of us remember what it was like to be 20. Lord, we ask that you bring forth these younger people and protect them. That you bring forth these people that they can see the love and they can see the honor that it shows you in a Veterans Day recognition that you can bring forth these people and grow them up in your love and in your church and in all that you would provide so that they can see that there is a better way than violence. There is a better way than envy. There is a better way than, than uh, selfishness. Lord, there is a, a, a way of sacrifice and there is a way of an outpouring of love that just overwhelms not only those present but those outside. Lord, we continue to honor those that have been in uniform. We continue to honor those that are in uniform. And we continue, Lord, to remember and honor those that at one time were in uniform and now they are with you. We honor the sacrifice. Lord, we honor the sacrifice made by those in the uniform of the police officer. For, Lord, they step out in faith, acknowledging the danger involved, and they go to the bar to save lives by calming a fight. They go to an accident, and they risk their lives by standing out in the snow and the cold to manage the situation. 
Lord, we honor those that are in the uniform of the firefighter because, Lord, we know for all of the science they are taught and for all of the precautions that they are taught, it is a dangerous thing to go into a building where things explode and things burn. Lord, we would pray that you would protect those people. We ask, Lord, that you protect those people in the uniform of the health person, the one that takes care of us, the one in the emergency room that greets people to attend to them, and you don't know what they bring into the emergency room. You don't know what they may be high on. You don't know if they're violent. You don't know what disease they have. Lord, we ask that you protect all of these people, for all of these people have been called by you to serve others. And Lord, we ask that you would protect them in doing so. Lord, we continue to pray for those that are going to be depressed at this time of the year. We continue to pray for those that are bewildered as to what to do next in life. Perhaps they've gone to college or they're going to go to college or they're switching jobs. Lord, they're just anxious about not knowing what to do next. Lord, give them your peace. Give them your sense of direction. Give them your sense of what to do next so that it overwhelms their hearts and they have a sense of peace. Lord, we come to you this morning, your human beings, your human beings that seek to be more like you each and every day, and we struggle at that, Lord. And so, Lord, in your grace, it is only by your grace that we are enabled to do anything good, to think anything good, to be anybody good. It is only by your grace. And we wish also by your grace to be cooperative with you and with all of your will in our lives. Lord, we wish to humble ourselves as Jesus humbled himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we will pray what he taught us to pray with feeling, with sincerity, with hope, with meaning, with the knowledge of what we say and speak is a reality in our hearts. We will pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jim, I'm told that you like to read scripture. I was, I was told correctly. Why don't you come and do so? during the announcements time, okay? Okay. Uh, today's uh, reading is out of the book of Acts, Acts 2, uh, verses 46 and 47. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The word of God for the peoples of God. Uh, he takes it very, very well and, and with love. And so I must say, and particularly for those of you that are out there in Facebook land, our reading this morning was done by Jim Morrison. And as we have many doors in this facility, if you were to visit... If visit Willow Creek United Methodist Church, you'd have an opportunity to see Jim Morrison and the doors. Let me get my, let me get my. <laughs> oh, that's clever. The sermon this morning is, what is a church for? What are you for in a church? It was the summer of 1978, and by the way, I've changed some names just to protect 
anybody. It was 1978. The pastor had been just uh, started his second year at this church, and I had been attending that church for eight years. This pastor was charismatic, dynamic, and prolific in terms of packing the pews. This pleased everybody at first. But then, abruptly, the pastor began removing people from their leadership positions, which they had had for years, thereby causing hurt feelings and setting the stage for a conflict between those in favor with the pastor and those not in favor. It was there that Sunday morning when Mel, in a very uncharacteristic action, stood and demanded from the pastor a legitimate explanation as to why a certain person had been removed from their leadership position. I was there that Sunday morning when the pastor from the pulpit boldly proclaimed, I'm the pastor, and if you don't like my decisions, there's the door. Mel looked at his wife and said, we're leaving. As his wife stood to leave with her husband, also about half of the congregation stood and followed. They had been part of those who had fallen from favor with the pastor. They went on to found another church in the same denomination. What was not negotiable for those that left was just who it is that leads and makes decisions for a church. The pastor and those he favored felt that the sole authority of the church was the pastor and others served at the pleasure of the pastor. I really hate that term, by the way. Mel, wife, others, and me included, held a non-negotiable position that leadership was supposed to be a balanced and joint role of the clergy and laity. Please know that the pastor is never very far from the pew. I took the tape measure and I measured between the pew and here, and it's about 10 feet. That is not very far. We pastors should never place ourselves on a pedestal, and more importantly, neither should you. The condition of joint role of clergy and laity is so in the United Methodist Church. All decisions at a conference level, like annual, jurisdictional, and general, are made by clergy and laity 50-50. The week before last, new bishops were elected and consecrated in Fort Wayne. They were elected by clergy and laity 50-50. At the local level, in a local church, decisions are generally made collectively. Um, basically, you know, I get, to, I get to say yes or no to people that, you know, want to come and get married. I get to say yes, I'm going to or not, or baptism or, or initial uh, membership. But generally speaking, there is a, a jointness to clergy and laity in decision making. Mel provided an example of something non-negotiable, that, that leadership in the church is, in fact, between clergy and lay. Another person, Betty. She was born some 90 years ago at St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Elkhart, about 22 years ago when the church trustees were considering selling the 100-year-old building, which was difficult to maintain and needed a half a million dollars to get it safe. She said, I will not allow this church to be sold. And she had enough clout to make that so. She had grown up in that church. Pastors come and go. The style of music you do comes and goes. But by golly, that building was there, and it was a sacred space to her. That was non-negotiable for her. A few years ago, I was at a, a meeting someplace, and there was a couple of um, people I got to talking to. They had gone to a church a couple of hours south of here. United Methodist Church, and um, the wife was doing most of the talking, but she was saying that they left that church because a woman had been appointed as pastor there. And she referred to what Paul had written to Timothy. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over man. She must be quiet. And so what was non-negotiable for those people for that particular couple, was that they were not going to go to a church where a woman was pastor. A couple more here. 
For the Apostle Paul, giving advice to the church in Corinth, regardless of who possesses what wonderful gift, what was more valuable than anything else and non-negotiable was this sense of love. What is non-negotiable for me personally in my own life is that I attempt the best I can with the grace of God to live out the person, character, and heart and mind of Jesus. What is not negotiable for me is that in the congregational life, there is continuity of growth toward the likeness of Christ. The old churchy term for it would be sanctification. And so I ask you to consider within your own hearts the next few weeks, the next few months, to be prayerful about it, is what is not negotiable for you as you have grown up in the church and if you have experienced many things, you've seen pastors come and go, you've seen differences in the church. What, what holds church together for you in your heart? What is, in fact, church to you? The verses from Acts 2 that Jim Morrison read for us, in part, you know, uh, describes the early habits of the early church folk. They met together. Being together seems to have been a value to these early Christians. And I know we grow up on, and come to church and we meet on Sunday, and it used to be we'd meet on Sunday night and Wednesday night. I guess some churches still do that. But we've gotten away from that in an awful lot of ways. And we come together, and particularly in this day and age, you just never know because, you know, we, we seem to have so many disagreements politically, religiously, and even how to dress at church still. You ever get that? Break here for just a moment. Honest to goodness, do you really think God cares how you're dressed? Maybe you do think he does. They met in the temple courts, not within the temple itself, but they met in the midst of people coming and going, business taking place, life being lived out in public. And remember, Jesus had been recently crucified, so these Christian people were not like state approved, okay? They were still uh, very uh, suspicious to people. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. When we read that, I think many folk have in mind the ceremonial way that we do communion. The early church, the way they did communion, was actually having meals together, real meals in each other's homes, befriending each other, seeing somebody on the street, and that person will say, hey, is it true what I hear about these Christians? And then they get into a conversation, invite them home, and then that's how you make Christians. They had glad and sincere hearts. That's not always easy to do in a world that wants us to feel cynical and sad about everything. We are thrust upon by headlines that are just sad and cynical all the time, and yet we are called to be glad and to be thankful. Praising God, they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And again, enjoying the favor of all the people. It was in a day and age, and today is a day and age like this as well, where it seems to be me, me, me. I'm trying to get the best that I can get out of this deal. I'm trying, whichever way it is. You go to a car lot, and you're trying to save as much money, and they're trying to make as much money. Everybody's trying to make the, the deal for themselves. And the early Christians were trying to accommodate other people as best that they could. Hospitality, I suppose they call it. What is described here is not formal building-focused order of worship. Early church practices were more about the social interaction of people rather than a pew-packed sanctuary, which Betty loved and still does, by the way. And just to draw out a bit further the differences between early church practices and how we operate today, let me read these two verses that that happened just before what Jim read to us. And so pay attention. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. My goodness, doesn't that sound a bit socialist? You can relax a little bit. Those practices were written about 1,500 years before ideas of capitalism or socialism came about. 
It's not an endorsement of socialism. And yes, I'm sure that there were some entrepreneurship and shared charity that took place at the time, but not in the contemporary West versus East, Adam Smith versus Karl Marx kind of discussion. I offer those early church practices and those examples of what might be non-negotiable so that you can be stirred, so that you can be inspired to consider not only what is most important to you as a member of a congregation, but for you to think about, well, what is church all about? Why do we exist as a congregation? So you've heard me mention the Barna Group before. It's an organization that studies religious and church matters. And they say regarding church, quote, the majority of both practicing Christians and churched adults say they feel as if they have connected with God or personally experienced the presence of God most of the time or frequently following a church service. Roughly seven in 10 practicing Christians and three in five churchgoers also affirm that most of the time they leave worship feeling as if they had learned something new. And by golly, I hope that when you leave a church service, you feel or know that you've learned something new. That's what I intend to do, because I learn something new every week when I read that scripture. I tried to find Barna's differences between practicing Christian and churchgoer, but I couldn't find a good definition. But, you know, maybe it doesn't matter all that much. This is a discussion about what you bring to church and what you get out of it, and just a funny for a moment. When I was hiring people for maintenance and custodial positions, I would ask among many questions, what do you want out of this job? And I would ask, what do you bring to this job? Most of the answers that I would get would be things like, I want to see the results of my work. That's cool. I want to contribute to the organization's goals. They all had very, very lofty answers, but nobody, literally, not one of them ever said, I want a paycheck. What is your paycheck that you get from church? What do you take home with you? I know you bring a lot of gifts and everything, but what is it that you want out of church? When we attend church, become part of the church, we bring many things to it. It could be worship, it could be praise, it could be love, it could be charity. What is it that you walk home with? Is it spiritual strength for the week? Is it a sense of belonging with other people? Consider those things. In this day and age of declining church attendance, denominational reorganization, and mission ambiguity, I don't have time in this service sermon to talk about mission ambiguity, but it was like, what, what are we supposed to do kind of thing? It's a good thing to be in prayer and consider, always with the help of the Holy Spirit, what do you want from a church? What do you bring? And by golly, what is this church about? You can be entertained at a concert or a movie theater. You can socialize at a high school reunion. You can serve the community in a Lions Club. What makes church different? For me, it is engaging with people who want to be more Christ-like in his person, character, teachings, and conduct. Another church-related question may be, what is God's will for this particular congregation? Now, I'm going to give you the wild card scripture, okay, from Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And a lot of people live, leave off this next part, but it is equally important. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. But how do we go about doing that, making disciples? Since this sermon series is intended as a prompting to consider which path this congregation should take, UMC or exiting in some way, allow me to offer from the uh, UMC website why we exist. Local churches faces growing challenges and also incredible missional opportunities. As a conference, 
Our goal is to support all types of leaders with the resources they need to make disciples and transform their communities. In a world that increasingly questions if the local church still matters, we are focused on unifying our people, energizing our mission, and building vibrant communities. And so the Indiana Conference of the United Methodist Church has many good things. I don't, I don't say these things to, to push in a direction. Just I would be negligent if I did not tell you about these things. There are grant, uh, grants available for mission ideas, um, grants of classes available for laity regarding leadership, camping opportunities for teens. And so, you know, I would just bring those things to your attention so that you can look into them. But also, I know that many folk place little value on connectionalism. I know that just like a lot of people would prefer to watch a church service and be involved in it from, from their kitchens or their living rooms, and that's legitimate, okay? There are a lot of congregations that feel that their ministry strength is, is being their own standalone church, untethered from having to uh, be involved with other, other churches. The early churches were not connected in conferences and districts, but for sure the individuals in those early churches interacted with the general public, and through that interaction, God caused them to grow, as it is reported here, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Whether connected to the outside world by the design of a conference or by the intentional activities of an independent congregation, the will of God for all churches seems to be actual and intentional relationship development, reaching out to those that don't yet know Christ. Yes, we uplift each other. We love each other. We pray for each other. But if one way or another we're not trying to get somebody introduced to Jesus. We're just not fulfilling all of it. So a relevant question is, how best can you make that happen? Is it through the United Methodist Church? Is it independent or some other connection? And yet still another question, what is God's will for me, any of us, as a member of this congregation? In 1978, when everybody was leaving that church that day that Mel questioned the pastor and about half the church left and I left as well, it was literally on the way out the door that I was thinking within myself, how can I get these two churches reunited at some point in the future? And it took about 10 years, but that was a, a, that was a discipline set upon me by the Holy Spirit as I left. And eventually what I did was, since neither church had enough people to form one softball team to be in a league, I thought that it might be a good idea that we joined forces and to create a league. And through the, the working of that, they finally did reconcile and, and such. We reach out into the world in different ways. We make church in different ways. It may indeed be in this 21st century that church and how we do church can change. The early church did it remarkably differently, and so very, very many people came to Christ and to the church. In times where the church was not sanctioned by the state, in fact, the church was, was kind of, you know, they looked upon those early Christians as kind of with a, a suspicious eye sort of thing. Times change, the way we do church can change, Technology is a wonderful way to get the word out there, but nothing will ever take the place of you and me getting into a conversation with somebody and saying, well, this is what I believe and this is why. Would you, would you, like, me to, would you like me to share this with you? Meaning the Bible, meaning Christ. That is the way that we do it. It's always the way that's going to be the most fundamental a decision that you can pray about is, does that happen easier or better or more effectively in the United Methodist Church? Or is there another model for you? That is your decision to make with the prayer and the aid of the Holy Spirit. Let us take time to pray. Our Lord, 
we humble ourselves again. We lay our trophies and crowns at your feet. We look to you for guidance, knowing that loving others, getting others to know you, is ultimately what we are all about. Help us figure out how to do that. We pray in your precious name, amen. Please stand as we sing our closing song that's also our benediction, which is, O oh, Breath of Life. by God with a mission and with spiritual gifts and collectively that is all just itching to burst out upon this unsuspecting world in glory allow that glory to burst out I leave you in peace Uh, we have a letter here from